All of us are out of work. So. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, God's blessing for all cardiologists to look after yourself and family for three Absolutely, months. Absolutely, yeah. You are right, Girish. <laughs> so very true. Uh, yeah, uh, heaven in hell. <laughs> yeah, very true. I think a lot of introspection. Sir should know better. So uh, I think better perspective will emerge after COVID. I guess. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Deepak, shall we start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, uh, shall we go ahead? Uh, yes, sir, please. I just yeah, small introduction, sir. Uh, good, good evening to all of you. Uh, it's my pleasant privilege to invite you all and welcome you all to this particular webinar on uh, uh, basics of coronary angioplasty and how to avoid, prevent complications and manage complications. Now, when we started doing our DM cardiology in 2000, we never used to attend conferences. But the first one that I attended was the Indo-French conference that was attended, that was conducted in Chennai. And uh, Dr. Matthew Samuel, sir, and uh, Mary Claude Morris were the lead operators during the live course. And uh, I was so excited by sir's uh, talk, the presentations, the words of wisdom. Uh, even now, 20 years down the line, every time I get a chance to listen to him, I never miss that. Sir, um, we learned a lot of basics from you in cardiology and the most complex stuff from you. And uh, so I thought it will be a good opportunity for the youngsters also to listen to you. Uh, so we never had to think about any, any other person to moderate this session. So thank you so much for taking your time off this weekend and being with us. Uh, let me also welcome and uh, thank uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar. Uh, Vijay Kumar is the senior consultant cardiologist at uh, Madras Medical Mission. He is supposed to be the best, best uh, person reg with regards to physiology and imaging in India, maybe not in India, in our con continent. He's supposed to be the best person. Any doubt, you can phone him up anytime, talk to him. Uh, Vijay, thank you for your time. Let me also welcome Dr. Shiva, uh, the most aggressive interventional cardiologist in, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, Shiva and his team, uh, Dr. Sampath and Dr. Selmani and team. Uh, Shiva, thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you so much for being with us. Let me also invite Dr. Girish. Let me also thank you uh, for being with us, Dr. Girish. Uh, he's the chief chief cardiologist at uh, Apollo Hospital, mm -hmm. Bangalore. Uh, thank you for being with us. I hope uh, this uh, session turns out to be very useful for at least the youngsters uh, with Ma somebody like Matthew Samuel sir being with us. And with this introduction, let me request Matthew Samuel sir to take over the uh, session and go ahead with it. Sir, kindly go ahead. Uh, thank you, Deepak. Uh, thank you all and uh, to all the youngsters who are waiting to listen to very, very important sessions today. I um, I should uh, thank Deepak to have selected this because people have started forgetting. Don't want to know how to select a guiding catheter or a guide wire. But they want to do the left main angioplasty. That is the trend today. Deviating from that, coming back to the basics, it's very encouraging and very uh, worthwhile exercise what they are doing. And they have selected me to moderate the session because over the years you must have seen I am the person who has had the maximum complications. So, uh, naturally, they have to select that person to be the moderator. And what we have done over the years is openly discuss all the complications. We uh, genuinely, I wanted to extend my uh, uh, foot for all of you to stand and grow from there. Learn from the mistakes. You don't have to commit the same mistake that I did. I could get away with those mistakes because there is nobody else who could have corrected me. But today you have the opportunity to learn from our mistakes. Let us see what you will gain from today's two days of two hours of intensive uh, detailed discussions on different topics. And excellent speakers. You have got Vijay Kumar Girish and Shiva and of course ending off with Deepak. Shall we start with Vijay? Vijay, please go ahead. He will 
talk on the femoral side. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, share my So, uh, good evening to everyone. I thank uh, Dr. Deepak uh, and Matthew sir for this opportunity. And there's a small conflict uh, maybe among the people sitting here. I might have done the least number of femoral punches. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm the appropriate person to deliver this talk, but I'll just try to uh, do whatever best I can do. So, we start with, we all know, so we all use radial axis. So that has become the default uh, strategy for coronary angiography and PCI. And uh, studies have shown that it is associated with the lower incidence of exercise complications and outcomes are obviously better because of this low exercise and bleeding complications. And however, uh, with the complex coronary interventions, uh, need for chemodynamic support, and the most of the structural heart endovascular interventions still mandate femoral approach. And femoral access site complications are common and may sometimes be life threatening. And optimal access and post procedural management is essential to avoid these complications. First, we shall start with some of the basic anatomy. And we all know uh, the infradenal abdominal aorta that divides into two common, common iliac arteries, they run down into pelvis, and they divide into an external ilia and then general ilia, and the iliac goes down into the pelvis to supply the pelvic organs. The external iliac artery runs over the pelvic organs and the muscle tissue without a bone support towards the thigh. So below the inguinal ligament, which is connecting from anterior superior spine to the ubiquibuccal, it just cross, it goes across and becomes the common femoral artery. Common, so this whole part is without the bone support. And when it becomes common femoral artery, that's where it comes over the bone again. So it just goes down and uh, goes down over the pubic bone and the femoral head and then divides into its branches, the deep femoral and superficial femoral. Again, if you do deep and superficial femoral arteries, again, much away from bone, which is only lying on the muscle mass. So only this part of the artery, that is a common femoral artery, which goes over the pubic bone and your femoral head, is the only part that has a bony support through this goes from external iliac artery to branches of the common femoral. So this is where uh, we have to puncture because uh, most of these femoral exercises are manually compressed. So you have to aim for a bone for support for your compression like this. So this is the only part of the artery which is under over the bone. So that is where you have to puncture. And there are two important uh, uh, branches uh, you have to remember. One is the inferior epigastric artery. Inferior epigastric artery is actually a branch of uh, external iliac artery, which goes down behind the inguinal ligament and goes around the inguinal ligament and goes to the anterior abdominal wall. So the lower margin of this uh, inferior epigastric artery marks your retrofitting space and your inguinal ligament. Another branch is the uh, uh, complex iliac artery. So this is not important uh, to mark. It just goes along your uh, inguinal ligament. And one important caveat for this branch is when you use a micropuncture axis, the wire often goes into this branch. So uh, rarely it can go and perforate and produce a uh, hematomas here. So this is uh, from the basics of your uh, uh, anatomy of your femoral artery. The most important thing is the landmark here, which is the pubic bone and femoral head, and the common femoral artery, which is overlaying it. That is the only part which is compressible to lies over the bone. So any puncture above this landmark can result in not compressible and result in retrofitting <coughs> and any puncture below this that may result again you are not able to compress that may result in pseudo aneurysms in hematomas and so moving forward so what are the contraindications for femoral punch it is not all absolute contraindications few of them are absolute and few of them relate to or you have to take more care when you do femoral access one is the most important thing is peripheral vascular, particularly the occlusive disease. And the prior femoral artery bypass craft surgery. 
and presence of extensive inguinal scar scarring from radiation therapy, surgery, and clear catheterization. Again, this is not an absolute contraindication. The presence of excessive tortuous and the calcified iliac controls, particularly when you have to use a large core access, and a morbid obesity. And these things you have to remember, even though these are not contraindications, again, more prone for femoral site complications. Uh, CRF on hemodialysis. And another conditions associated with white pulse pressure, such as uh, systemic hypertension in elderly, aortic regurgitation, and similar conditions. Whenever you have a wide pulse pressure, again, they're more prone to developing bleeding complications. CRF is a very, very important subset. So where it is a high pulse pressure, particularly patients who are on hemodialysis, along with uh, uh, platelet and bleeding, uh, means uh, coagulation factor abnormalities predispose them to bleeding complications. And uh, starting with the femoral access kit, this is the kit to be used to use when we were students and in the early part of our practice here. That, so this is a 018 uh, gauge needle, and this is a wire we use it. Uh, this is 035 wire. And this is the one uh, which almost uh, we replaced this uh, bigger needles with this micro punches. Uh, this is the one we commonly use uh, for all our femoral access. And this is your 21 gauge introducer needle. And this is your, this is coming in two sizes. One is a five French axis or four French uh, uh, axis seats. And this is the 018 wire. So this is the system we commonly use now. And see the dramatic difference here. This the bigger needle produces a hole of 1.3 millimeter square. So you have to, if suppose your puncture is not in the optimal position, you have to take a compress for a bit longer time. And this one produces only a 0.5 millimeter. As, uh, area hole in the femoral artery. So you apply for pressure for two, three minutes, you should be all done. Right. And this is a handheld ultrasound system, the V scan from GE. This is the one we commonly use for using alpha cone spider puncture. And what are the various methods for femoral access? First one is a pul uh, palpatory method. This is the one we used to use when we were students. And, and the second one is a fluoroscopic. And the third one is ultrasound guided method. And fourth one is a combined method. We start with the palpatory method. This is a method we were taught when we were uh, students uh, in JIPMA. So, and how do you do this one? You determine the location of the inguinal development. Commonly, we use inguinal crease, or you just palpate and use the iliac spine, your pubic cubicle, and keep your uh, fingers over that. So, there's a middle finger which marks your uh, inguinal ligament, and you select a point uh, three millimeters, three centimeters below this. So, then you start your puncture. And your punch and needle, uh, uh, arterial axis end up around two millimeter below the ligament. That is where the middle of the femoral head. So this is how we used to puncture. Uh, but what are the problems with this approach? The inguinal crease is not. Uh, it is notoriously unreliable in making the location of the inguinal ligament, and it is difficult to appreciate the location of the inguinal ligament with palpatory palpation, especially in obese patients. There is a risk of suboptimal access due to variable trajectory of the needle. And there is an inability to control anatomical variants and pathologies such as high bifurcation, plot, or calcification. Then came the second, though this is an example here, it's just I'm locating the inguinal crease with my uh, forceps here. You just see that how, how below it is below the femoral head. And suppose I choose this landmark, I end up uh, with a puncture uh, below your femoral head. The second patient, it is exactly on the. This is the uh, this is the most appropriate one. So your femoral crease is uh, exactly at the lower part of your uh, femoral head. So I start the puncture here. You may end up with the common side. So so it is a very unreliable landmark. Is your femoral crease for in your inguinal leg. And then came this fluoroscopic uh, access. There are multiple ways of doing it. One either you can just keep it uh, your uh, forceps uh, at the at the lower part of your femoral head and uh, mark this one with your, your finger and start your puncture here and uh, you, you end up with one centimeter above so you end up with the middle third of your femoral head or you can just keep your marker at the middle of the femoral head keep your finger and start your puncture one centimeter below your finger then you end up with the appropriate size in the femoral artery however what is the problem with this fluoroscopic guided axis it cannot account for high common femoral artery bifurcation, which is superior to the inferior border of the femoral head and the inferior border of the midpoint of the femoral head. 
are very high bifurcations that means superior to the midpoint of the femoral head so this high bifurcation this is very high bifurcation uh, in a study of 940 patients so the bifurcation occurred in 64% of the patients it is below the head of the femur and 98% it is uh, below the mid, mid mid part of the femoral head so if you puncture in the middle part middle third or at the midpoint then you most of the time you end up with the common femoral head. and another important caveat uh, uh, using this approach so suppose you see this patient this is a thin patient with not much of a subcutaneous tissue and this is your common femoral artery you start with the lower end of the femoral head and you aim with a 45 degree angle to the femoral artery you end up with uh, the site which is below your middle of the femoral head suppose you have an obese patient with a lot of subcutaneous tissue again 45 degree you end up with uh, an axis which is below the middle of the femoral head. this is an important problem you have to understand whenever you have to move deeper into the uh, femoral uh, deeper into the uh, uh, means the groin without getting your artery then you have, you have to be always vigilant just to screen and see that where you're exactly going and just pull back make your trajectory a bit more vertical to avoid high punctures and the next came this ultrasound guided puncture ultrasound guided puncture use ultrasound to select your anterior wall of the femoral artery and uh, and it is above over the femoral head okay that is how we use ultrasound so what are the problems with this ultrasound guided approach finding the femoral bifurcation by ultrasound we use this method then scanning up further to get the harman femoral artery however fixing on a stick or the harman femoral artery the no regard for the location is all related to the view base or your femoral head so the bifurcation you just select your bifurcation and go up to your common common femoral artery but this may still be lower than your femoral head or it sometimes can be much higher part of the femoral head so you don't have control over that then again uh, you have to if you are aiming for a uh, artery you may go through multiple in and out movements the axis needle may take a zigzag and a jet line track so that again it may be may not be appropriate for your axis closure or it may result in taking complications so these are the various uh, 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 drawbacks of your ultrasound guided approach alone so now what is the recommendation for optimal femoral axis optimal femoral axis is guided by ultrasound fluoroscopy so ultrasound gets you into the vessel which has used a single puncture in the center of the artery and avoids inadvertent injury to the unbodied structures and use fluoroscopy to which gets you to the vessel in the right place as you entry into the artery over your uh, pubic bone or your femoral head the ideal axis is a single front wall puncture the center of the artery at 45 degree angle so it should be over the pubic bone or femoral head so this is a way they recommend you to do it so this you just to see that this is ultrasound axis and this is your common femoral this is uh, your common femoral artery and this is your uh, uh, femoral vein and you see that if you just move little below you see uh, your profunda femoris and uh, superficial femoral artery this is the point you had identify you can just see that we are just uh, locating your uh, artery here the superficial femoral artery and this is your deep femoral artery and this is your venous structure how do you differentiate these two venous structure is usually medial when you upper, uh, apply compression the venous structure collapses the artery doesn't collapse and here you can just see that you look just move up get that artery here and you can see that so this is how you locate use an ultrasound probe you locate to the middle of the femoral head and use your needle to puncture you can just see that you can see the needle movement uh, the needles are now coming with uh, uh, material that uh, that helps you in recognizing yourself when you move inside the tissue plane to see that it's exactly landing in the middle of the fem middle of your femoral artery and an additional advantage is you just see that this site doesn't have any block you can identify any calcification or a block at the site of entry once you're done this thing then i'm just introducing the wire inside so this is a way they recommend you to do your femoral puncture and suppose you have to use a large bore axis if again you can use this fluoroscopy and ultrasound guided method what are the other methods have been described this is the method we use commonly for our tavi axis you can just see that you just put the picta into the uh, groin from the opposite side and locate your common femoral artery 
and uh, puncture through this uh, eye of your uh, pigtail. So that is how you end up exactly on the anterior wall and the middle of the artery. The second method is use a wire as your landmark and use this landmark and uh, puncture this side of the artery. The third thing is you just uh, take an injection that use that roadmap and you puncture. So these are the various uh, fluoroscopic guided ways of getting access for large pore vessels. Okay, so what are the various tips and tricks? Uh, I'm sure Matthew sir will extend more on these things. So these are the few things uh, to remember. If your wire is curling at the tip, you are putting the wire inside, it is curling at the tip. That means that you are not inside the artery. And most often the needle has moved out when you are just uh, trying to take your wire and it has just moved out. And if you need to apply, suppose if when the patient is obese, you have to apply a lot of compression with your fingers before entering your artery. You have to make sure that you hold the compression till you put your wire inside. Suppose you just leave your finger, it just releases uh, your the tension over your tissues and that automatically uh, pulls your needle out of the vessel. So that you have to remember whenever you use a lot of compression, just maintain the compression uh, before you, you put your wire. And always move a bit in. When you just observe that there is a spurt of blood, always move a little inside. So otherwise, you'll be just end up with the surface of the artery. I'm going to show some of the examples for this. And always aim for an anterior puncture because inadvertent posterior wall puncture may end up with developing pseudoaneurysms. And always pass the wire under fluoroscopy and try to avoid common, means uh, uh, circumflex iliac artery, which is the common occurrence when you use your micropuncture wire. And avoid using hydrophilic wire when you are using a bigger needle and puncturing. Try to avoid using hydrophilic wire. And if you're using it, you should never attempt to pull the hydrophilic wire from the needle at the end in shivering of the wire. And use an adequate pre dilatation with the dilators whenever you're having a difficulty in entering inside. So particularly in the case with previous access and severe fibrosis. And avoid vertical entry that may result in sheath kinking and use longer sheath and exchange wires in case of severe transversity. And beware of people with thin or obese appetites and white pulse pressure. They are more prone to develop respiratory complications. And they do not administer heparin until you confirm the optimal access position by an hand injection. And take utmost care when you access artery or vein in the presence of adjacencies. Sometimes uh, just goes uh, in a... <coughs> in a slanting way so you just so if your artery is going like this you try to puncture your vein you may end up in your sheath so that will end up in a lot of bleeding and hematoma and always flush the sheath in between exchanges particularly when you're not administered suffering. otherwise the sound can form your sheath and always use long wires it is our practice always to use we never use short wires for putting our sheets we always use the long wire and put our sheath and we never remove the wires at all. We directly take the catheters inside. We do not remove this wire before introducing the catheter. In case the vessel is tortuous, the sheath may be against the vessel wall. And that may create a dissection when you pass your wire. I'm going to show you an example for that. And always check the access before administering the print. It is very, very important. If there is a low or high puncture is identified, there should be a low threshold to remove the needle. And particularly in a micro puncture needle, it doesn't matter. You just apply manual pressure for two to three minutes and re puncture again in the correct position. And all the long sheaths preferably should be introduced over a support wire to avoid complications, particularly in a tortuous artery. So, this is what happened. So, this is actually a correctly punctured one. We got a flow of blood. This is what happened actually. So, we have to administer a lot of pressure to just get the tissue down. And uh, inadvertently, that was released the wire, the needle has come. So that's why you can just see that when you see this type of uh, wire curling, that means you are not inside. This is what it happens. You have to go inside and maintain that position. Then only the wire goes nicely. We just keep it still. You get the blood flow, but the wire do not enter. You just move above the artery on the surface. So this you should avoid. And the second thing this guy was mentioning, this is your uh, circumflex iliac artery. But most of this uh, micro puncture wires just through this. Sometimes you can go to the end and perforate and release the So it is always a good practice to introduce a wire under fluoroscopy, particularly when you use the micro puncture system. 
and uh, this is an example of a femoral axis with a touch velocity whenever you find that these type of uh, arteries this is again microcentric system and uh, uh, you always uh, use a stiffer wire means o3 5 wire and the fluoroscopy just to gently take this wire around and i'll never take this wire out so if there is a severe touch velocity i just put the sheet in and I take a jr4 and just make it then then each exchange either you have to use a exchange wire or you have to keep a o o3 by regular length wire up before removing it and reducing it and we just see that the same patient here after removing so this is what has happened by the wire you can just see it looks like a lot of stenosis here this actually the stenosis per produced by the touch was this pull out this wire so this type of vessels if you are not very careful you end up digesting these places when you just try to push across the cells you end up digesting these places. okay then again this is uh, uh, the tortuous artery just see that the artery is tortuous here you are see this exactly landing this if you are remove the wire and try to access this this is where you just end up the digesting so this should be avoided and always keep the wire inside before putting your catheter in we just always use the lamp as you can just see it this is actually the sheet has produced a nice section here you end up don't really push your wire then again it end up with the extensive retrograde digestion and suppose you find a early bifurcation uh, it is very high up here so what you have to do you should not aim for a common femoral artery you have to select uh, use the probe again just keep it here in the middle of the femoral head to try to identify larger of these two vessels it's usually it is the focus of femoral artery they try to access it and uh, this proceed with as if like you are inside the common femoral artery don't ever try to attempt to puncture here that will end up uh, in a space where there is no uh, place for your compression to happen okay so now uh, we shall move to uh, some of the exercise complications here this is another patient that is nicely accessed vessel and uh, uh, so we had some difficulty in pushing uh, this happens when you use a non hydrophilic sheet now most of the cases we just switch to thermos sheets with a hydrophilic non hydrophilic sheets if there is some resistance it just bevels uh, and uh, this was just beveled uh, sheet was just tried to push in that resulted in bleeding here because it is a six french and it is located over the femoral head we just to put get away with the manual compression for the patient and uh, this is uh, one of the disastrous patients uh, and uh, this lady this is a 42 year old male and diabetic uh, he had a stent in 2013 and the present it was with anterior wall mi after discontinuation of the pure and the therapy so this was the uh, stent it was concluded and uh, because the pay patient had ongoing chest pain the decision was made to open the artery so actually what happen these type of patients with the sit them out and talk to that center and then i can take them back inside the catheter inside the catheterization laboratory so this was taken uh, in and uh, so they tried putting uh, a sheet was uh, say they tried putting wire so before that uh, aspirin was given through intravenous tube they tried putting a tampon wire inside that was not going they tried putting the thermo wire that could not pass and they aspirated it there was no flow maybe i think if we should not have injected in this place and that injection must be made you can just see that she is totally outside and it is created a big hematoma and the blood is seeping into the second space and this up till this point the uh, patient was stable and uh, within a minutes uh, he developed the groin pain initially hemodynamics were stable and subsequently started developing abdominal pain so we quickly put the opposite the first thing we did is we reverse heparin and uh, took the pigtail from the opposite side and this is what uh, we could see you can just see that our catheter is our uh, this thing is uh, totally outside so it is entered into the femoral artery and it moved out uh, of the femoral artery you can just see that femoral artery and some back here so then uh, we exchange it for a long sheet and crossed with the wire 
and uh, it just arranged for cover strings. We didn't have many of these type cover strings in the uh, the thing we just started for some from other hospitals. And during the waiting time, just see here, it's totally outside, and we put the wire and uh, serially uh, prolonged the balloon occlusion here. You can just see that how rapidly the hematoma was expanding. It's almost uh, this uh, bladder is used. This is one of the most sensitive signs of the expanding due to peritoneal hematoma. So after prolonged uh, uh, balloon occlusion, the bleeding slowly settled, and with multiple transfusions and volume replacement, and patients uh, can be transitioned to it. So we didn't do the PPA on this system alone. And uh, you see that still there is some flow in this thing, but uh, Overall, uh, the hemodynamics are just remain stable. So we have already reversed that print. So we just uh, observe the patients. So what was the most probable thing happened? And retrospectively, nobody could understand what exactly has happened. So this is what has happened, actually. When the patient came out, uh, they, uh, 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 we just forgot to suture this one. So the sheet uh, actually almost totally came out. And our sister was going to get scolded by the consultant. So he just pushed the sheet inside. So without uh, telling anyone, so that is the, the, the sheet on outside the femoral artery. So the what has happened. And the second one, and uh, this was another disastrous case. This is the case, is the most important case in our institution. And uh, uh, we have one of our senior uh, colleagues, Dr. Lachinda, she's a uh, hardcore femoralist. And uh, we never does radial, even we do radial also, if you have to do a femoral, then we have means uh, PCI. The radial access will be pulled out, we have to do a femoral. So uh, this is an important landmark in this thing. So this patient is a 71-year-old female, the diabetic hypertensive interval volumi uh, thrombolized. So this one, uh, this one already was fairly okay, and uh, and RC also there was a lesion. So, uh, so underwent uh, a PCI to RCA with a 33 millimeter chain and a lady with a fairly straightforward process, but an obese lady uh, who had a femoral access. And the patient uh, went out and within uh, within no time, they means after the sheet was removed, uh, two, three hours, the patient had a little hypotension, 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 then urine output started falling because he was so obese. Uh, Nobody could observe the early hematoma. And once it started bulging in the groin, then, then only it was realized that she was bleeding in the groin. Then we took her back. You see that the puncture was, because he was so obese, the puncture was somewhere here. This had the lesser trochanter level. So, this is so low is a puncture, and the compression was not effective and started leaking from this side. So then, the, we wired from the opposite side. And again, it was very difficult. So this time we used ultrasound direct puncture and entered from the opposite side. And we used balloon dilatation and it was not helping with the bleeding. So then that time we didn't have many cover stents. So we had one 640 fluency. The fluency stent was uh, uh, deployed. We had only a shorter one. So that is not uh, Stop bleeding because it's a smaller size and a shorter length. She continued to bleed. See here, she continued to bleed after that. And we had to exchange for a nine front sheet to put in a bigger fluency stent. So the second fluency was dilated. So this is after first fluency. So we put a second fluency because the first one is not stopping. So it is the 840 fluency here and dilated with a 9 millimeter balloon. And after that, uh, we could stop the bleeding. But unfortunately, patient has developed uh, all sorts of complications, renal failure and, uh, uh, and hypotension, sepsis. And we could not uh, uh, save this patient. So this resulted after this uh, uh, patient, uh, Dr. Lashinda has become 100% uh, radiovis. He hardly does any femoral smoke. And another case, this was a case provided by uh, Dr. Sai, which is from uh, Matthew's unit. So this is, an, again, an obese patient. Sir might remember this patient. Uh, so it is an obese patient. You can just see that how 
how bent up in this mattress seat. I think, I think it was a complex case, so they put a Venus sheet also. They took a check shot, you just see that. But there was a mattress bleeding in the southeast region. And uh, so this was your DSA, which shows uh, bleeding clearly here. It is coming from one of the, I think when they attempted puncturing the venous, uh, they punctured one of the uh, arteries here, small arteries here, that started bleeding. So then because it is uh, bleeding heavy, bleeding continuously happening, they're given some heparin. So what they did, they came from the opposite side. Vijay? Yes, sir. Vijay, can you be still more louder? Oh, louder, sir? Yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry, sorry. There's only two, three more slides are there. Sorry. <laughs> so this one, so it was just to put a prograde catheter. It is a 018 catheter, a compatible catheter. Then they put a two centimeter and two millimeter into two centimeter lal coil inside. So after putting this coil, uh, the bleeding is stopped. Then they went ahead and they finished their complex angioplasty here. You can just see that this is a long sheet and a very complex uh, left main bifurcation angioplasty was done after that. And this is one of our patients uh, who have presented with uh, anterior wall and cardiogenic shock. So they, we have to continue uh, IBP for quite some time, maybe I think three to four days IBP we have to keep. And once we removed it, the patients uh, developed uh, acute uh, lower limb ischemia. And this is what we got, uh, got a totally occluded femoral artery. There might have been a stenosis here that found the thrombus. And that was crossed here and the serially balloon dilated. We attempted multiple balloon dilatations and aspiration, everything. So we could not succeed in getting the flow at all. So then we decided to put a stent here. This is one of our colleagues' patients. So this is the 7150 Protegy Everflux stent. And we dilated with the 8 millimeter balloon. And finally, we got a good flow distally with the residual thrombus proximal part. So we just continued with anticoagulation for some more time. And she became all right. And then this is one of the where, uh, means uh, rare cases. I was just uh, talking to you about uh, renal failure patients. Renal failure patient, uh, we, if there is no fistula, we always prefer a radial access. And if this lady unfortunately had a fistula, one side that is failed, and another side that is another fistula they created, so we could not go through the radial approach. Little obese lady. And uh, Good arteries, and you can just see that we punctured through the femoral head. I used, I only did this case, micro puncture set. I used only a four French. Now, nowadays, we use the femoral diagnostic angiograms with a four French uh, system. So, just but uh, post, and she had some dissection. So, then I have to take a fem left to femoral access. And the left side, uh, we did finish the angiogram. They removed the left sheath first, and the right sheath second. She had first developed a left sided hematoma. That was compressed successfully. Right side was normal. And I kept her in ICU because uh, she looked like that she's going to bleed. But exactly, she bled in the night and developed a huge swelling uh, uh, in, in, in the groin. And just see that this is a CT image. If you can see clearly, there's a thick slowdown of the thumb. Just see that this is the slowdown of the thumb. The small distance here. And, uh, and in the end, we just tried compressing all these things. Nothing worked out. We are less. Uh, we are not very comfortable injecting thrombus because uh, the radiologist felt uh, that uh, there is uh, two communications in this artery, so we didn't uh, do that. And in the end, she underwent surgery, and uh, uh, so was ligated, and the artery was ligated. And this is another patient who had a pseudonorism. You can just see that this is arterial access, and this is your pseudonorism cavity, and this is the flow into the aneurysm. And we just used uh, ultrasound probe compression and in the end, uh, the aneurysm was successfully compressed. And to summarize, I, I didn't have many pictures for retrograde dissection. We had few, but uh, the last one week, I could not identify one. Another complication is just with artery venous fistula. These are the things, again, you have to keep in mind. So to summarize, optimal femoral access is a key to success uh, for success of many complex percutaneous interventions. Many femoral access site complications can be avoided by proper access techniques. Always assume that access site will be managed by manual compression alone. And early recognition and optimal management of complication is important to prevent adverse procedural outcomes. Thank you so much.
maybe i think mathis sir can add lot of things to this presentation thank you vijay <coughs> deepak what is the plan you want to discuss uh, the femoral axis now or uh, go yes, on yes sir. we'll 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 have some discussion because there are few questions also so yeah. we'll have a discussion before we move on to the next topic Go ahead. I I have been seeing a lot of comments from Madrajan in between. Uh, um, if he has to make any comments or anybody else want to comment or uh, take up the questions, then yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, one one question is why why pulse pressure is a contraindication for femoral puncture? Can we just take it? Up? Yeah, this uh, the uh, pulse pressure is the one which decides your pulsatility of the artery. So particularly when you have this renal failure patients in the aortic regurgitation all these patients uh, they have wide pulse pressure they are prone to develop uh, bleeding complications so whatever femoral complications we had so far most of the patients were renal failure with uh, uh, fistulas so these patients will have some platelet abnormalities and wide pulse pressure and again aortic regurgitation and other patients with wide pulse pressure they always have uh, a higher tendency for bleeding even when you touch so when they puncture the way it pulses at all that looks like it is going to burst at any time so what is your take sir on this sir mathi sir why why do we have why why pulse pressure generally have got a higher tendency to bleed but that is not a contraindication but it, it is not a I, i told you it is a relative you have to escape, take more care in doing that uh, and unfortunately am... most of these renal failure patients uh, We'll have some calcium and other things. You can't use an access closer also. The uh, the question is, um, I am more scared of people who who have got very very superficial yeah, femoral no artery. No, how could any speak to? Easily palpable and actually thin thin person. You will say you will feel that you can. Uh, have a hemostasis very easily yeah. that is the one generally tends to bleed and bleed and bleed we underestimate the possibility of the because you need subcutaneous tissue lack of subcutaneous subcutaneous tissue is very very important issue and that also we should be very careful yeah, don't thin, underestimate thin, thin when you see ladies um then and i just now saw somebody asking a question vijay you should answer that i don't use ultrasound at all uh, okay. except in except in aortic uh, um, tower uh, yeah uh, so they are asking whether uh, the cardiac probe can be used for no uh, I, I, the, it doesn't work well sir you need a, a linear probe uh, uh, it, it is it is available so what the they use in our uh, opd is another place is for doing carotid doppler and other doppler but there are dedicated systems sonocyte is the one system people commonly use it and this is a g system v scan is a very nice one so the probe on one side you can do echo and other side you can use the doppler so this is the one we commonly use in our cath lab for doing our access and emergency echocardiography it's a very nice handheld system and there is another thing dedicated systems are available sonocyte and other systems are available another thing i wanted to point out was uh, uh, just screening uh, seeing extensive calcification of the femoral artery that also you have to be extremely careful extremely because extremely careful i meant to give us lots of trouble, trouble. there preferably you should use a closure device in those patients because they tend to bleed because once it is calcified those vessels the elasticity elasticity is almost lost they generally don't close well like in the case of renal failure patients they both of them preferably you should use a closure device i wish we had some time to discuss closure devices also because that is uh, in very very regular use in many of the labs Uh, the commonest available closure devices are perclos and your seal and, uh, and perclos so what is your preference uh, it is renal failure and other patients to use a perclos or and your seal because uh, most of them they have calcification the needles are very difficult to put inside that's so right sometimes they just tear and come out uh, per- perclos or uh, the present device name is proglide proglide 
See, the, if there is calcification, probably it also tends to give us some problem because yeah. when you take the suture line out, those needles get stuck in the calcium. And calcium. I have quite a bit of problems with flogulite also. And you see it is all right, but it tends to ooze all around. Yeah. There is no hard and fast rule, but uh, whichever you are familiar, you should start and, using and, and, the proglide and uh, angiosis because you need to be familiar when you to deal with the cases where you find there is a problem. And, and when you uh, hematoma before the end of the procedure itself, yeah. that means they are the ones likely to give us trouble. Trouble. It may be safer to use one of these devices and close it off. Proglide, one advantage is that even if after closing, if you keep the wire access open, even if there is some bleeding, you can use an angio seal onto that and the combination can very often stop all bleedings. Yes. The worst thing is the renal failure patients, you do angiogram or angioplasty, then the same night or next day morning, they dilate. That is when they bleed. Yeah. <laughs> And they use heparin. If, you're, if you don't tell them, they just use heparin in that. So they started bleeding. What are the other questions? Uh, uh, Deepak, any questions? Sir, yeah. sir, another one suggestion, a question from Natarajan, sir. Uh, Matthew, sir, have you, have you ever switched to, having done so many thousands of femoral punctures, have you switched over to the radial approach? And have you, uh, having said so, uh, would you suggest at least in one particular scenario, you would always prefer you going through the femoral approach, like doing a rotor, like doing a left main bifurcation stenting. Would you suggest to the younger crowd, uh, which situations one should prefer going through the femoral approach rather than being a radial fanatic? Um, I think uh, I will ask Shiva to answer the question. <laughs> Yeah. I'm not a great fan of radial. Uh, um, I'm not a radialist at all. 80% 80, 80 of my cases are femoral and I continue to prefer radial. The main reason may be selfish. I don't. I would like to stay away from the, uh, the X-ray as much as possible. Second is, I became so familiar with uh, femoral artery. Our uh, complication rate has been so... Uh, Minuscule, and not even one percent. Uh, if you look at an uh, average, any any bleeding complication or any complication related to that, so uh, I wouldn't be able to comment on uh, when would I switch to radial because the I am incompetent to comment the advantages of radial when compared to femoral. Femoral access uh, always gives me a lot of comfort because we have lots of variable. Uh, various guiding catheters available for intervention. The choices are unlimited, and your your familiarity with the devices are so much easier. So it is easy for somebody who has been used to femoral to continue to use it. Uh, Shiva is a very strong believer in radial, Good and idea. he is able to comment on that. Natarajan, I think uh, we will ask uh, leave that question for Shiva to address during his. Like yeah. uh, sure, sure, sir. Uh, during my talk, I will do that. Okay, okay. sir. One last then, question, sir. One last question, sir. Matthew, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir. Uh, while doing any way through, you know that nothing, no harm has been done to the coronaries, and um, you feel that something has happened to the groin or so. So, what would be your next step? Would you immediately image the groin? Would you start body with hypotension? What, 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 what all steps would you take? Would you start them on fluids, noradrenaline, naproben? What would be your next step? Let's say it's just a vasovagal syncope, but still, what are the things you would that, that would go through your mind? See, if I am not already committed to the interventional procedures and have not started dilating already. I, I have time to concentrate on the groin. I would prefer to, even if I wired the uh, conduit and given full dose of heparin, I would leave the wire there and come back and have a look at the femoral artery. Uh, very often what you can do is if you are suspecting that if there is any bleeding or not, you can inject through the side arm. It's not very 
very efficient, but very often uh, you may be able to detect any bleeding uh, if there is any counter puncture or you have had a small dissection, some complication. Very often you did not have any procedure, any difficulty getting the uh, wire in, sheet in. It happens is in the people who are obese. The sheath kings at the entry site. When it enters the femoral artery and your puncture direction is not exactly 45 degrees, it tends to kink at the entry site. And that can keep on oozing and giving you a hell of a lot of problems. You can you will find it very difficult to circumvent that. In that situation, I would like to ask one of my assistants or the scrub nurse to come and press the groin and hold. Very often, you can escape and complete the procedure with, by doing that. If still we have problems, we manage uh, whatever uh, procedures we have to do in any hypertension, what we would do otherwise. There is no separate dictum. If there is no other bleeding at the site, it, uh, the management has to be exactly the same as what you would do otherwise. Yes, sir. Then once the blood pressure comes up, you complete the procedure. If you still still the blood pressure is low in the in the seventies and eighties, I think you should abort your intervention, come out, take care of the groin, find out the problem, look after that, and reverse the heparin. Uh, you can you have all the liberties to do all that. Reverse the heparin and take care of the groin and bring the patient back on the next day or after a few days and do it. Don't be too aggressive and too greedy to complete the case that day. It's better to commit ourselves and talk to the patient and family that this, yes, there is an issue. I am not proceeding because the life of the patient is more important, which I cannot give it back. It's safe, say, safer to not to proceed with the intervention. Otherwise, you can go into lots of trouble. Post-intervention, if patient continues to be hypertension, Hypertensive, you can have stent closure, thrombus formation on the stent, various problems in the coronaries also. Don't do that. Step down and accept that, yes, we have limitations. Yes, sir. sir also, would you look, have a look at the bladder, the indentation of the bladder in halfway through if you encounter a hypotension? Just of, to course. Of, of course. Of course. Of course. That's correct. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shiva. Very, very nice. Sir, uh, um, Vijay, sorry. sir thank no, you. no problem, sir. So I just have to sir, leave for another thing. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Deepak, okay. sir. Vijay, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, sir. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Vijay. Shiva, let us yeah. hear from you. Hard and radialist. Let us hear from you. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, hope, uh, Dibu, are you able to see my screen? 